So time complexity is an often misunderstood concept in computer science. And whether it is because of teachings in universities or just things that you hear when you're looking up stuff, oftentimes time complexity is confused with how fast or slow an algorithm is. As we'll see, it's related to that, but a greater time complexity does not mean a faster algorithm, and a smaller time complexity does not mean a slower alg algorithm necessarily. So let's kind of go through this by example. So I'll call this problem one. And the problem here is we have a list uh, of strings that are called names. And my goal is to determine if this string, Catherine, the name, is in any of these names. So we have like Jesus, Madison, Kevin, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this. This is Nava, uh, Watt, Aiden, so far, you know, and so on and so forth. So one of the algorithms we can use is we can start at the beginning, the beginning of the list names, and check each element to see if any of them match our goal. So we check Jesus. Does that equal Catherine? No. Madison? No. Kevin? No. So on and so forth. Nicholas? No. Catherine? Yes. Samuel? No. Emily? No. And that's going to be our algorithm. So let's try to figure out how long that algorithm takes to run. So we have to define a few terms first. So first time we're going to define is n, which is the number of elements in the list. And then our total runtime is going to be some setup time. So in practical sense, that setup time could be running the algorithm itself. So finding the file in the list of files or all the setup that a computer does behind the scenes to set up running an algorithm. So maybe interpreting the language or parsing the language to make sure there's no uh, syntax errors, so on and so forth. Setup time plus a processing time. So that means every single time we have to do something. So going back slides in problem one, the processing time would be the time it takes to actually compare to see if Catherine is equal to Jesus, or if Catherine is equal to Madison, or so on. So that's the processing time. And that's going to be obviously multiplied by the number of elements we have um, in this case, because the number of elements we have is the amount of times we have to run this process, right? Because we have, let's say, 10 elements in list one, uh, or in list names. And so algorithm one has to run 10 times. So we make an assumption here. Uh, I'm just going to say, imagine if our setup time was 0.2 seconds, which if it was really that slow, if you're running a practical algorithm, you probably need a new computer, but that's okay. And same thing with processing time. We're going to say each comparison takes 0.1 seconds just so we can do some math here. But again, if it's really that slow, you're going to need a new computer. <laughs> um, so imagine our total runtime is equal to 0.2, our setup time, plus 0.1, our processing time, times the number of times we have to do this, which in our case, in algorithm one, is n number of times, the so number of elements in the list. Imagine n equals 5. So our total runtime is going to be about 0.7. Then if n equals 10, 1.2. n equals 20. So notice how each time here we're multiplying by 2. So if we double our amount of elements in the list, because we need to run this list for the amount of... Uh, we have to run this algorithm once for every element in the list, then we're going to also double our time here, or the number here, which is going to about close to double our overall time. In fact, the higher our n is, the closer these two are to double. So just to kind of show you that, 0.7 to 1.2, right? If we increase from 5 to, n, 5 to 10, well, if we were to double our runtime from, from uh, n equals 5 to n equals 10, that would be 1.4, right? which the difference between 1.2 and 1.4 is decently big. It's like 0.2 divided by 1.2, so it's like 1.6, so about 18%. So the setup time actually matters. That's about 18%. So if we look at n equals 40 compared to n equals 80, though, this doubling, then we got 4.2 to what we expect would be 8.4, and now the setup time is starting to matter a lot, lot less. So we got 0.2 to about... Uh, 8.4, so I can't do that math right off the top of my head, but that's going to be like 2.5%, I think. And so the setup time starts mattering less and less in regards to predicting what happens when we double or when we change our n as n increases. So that's going to be the idea here. So as n increases, setup time becomes unimportant. Therefore, our total runtime is related to 0.1 times n. It's It's close to the higher n gets. So this is assuming n is very high. And so let's kind of look at that estimate and run through the same analysis again. So 
at n equals 5, our total runtime is about 0.5. And then at n equals 10, our total runtime is about 1. And so here's where we're going to see the doubling that happens when we double n, is when we make the assumption that setup time is not contributory and it's negligible when n equals n is very high. So that brings us to point number two here, which is that total runtime scales by n. And notice how this n is in red because we're referring to algorithm one this whole time. So the scalability is n. Because if we double the n, then we're doubling the amount of things we have to do in this algorithm, which is going to double the amount of time based on the argument we made earlier. And so time complexity is a measure of scalability. And that might be the most important point I make in this entire video. Time complexity is scalability. So we go, go through this analysis of setup time plus processing time times the number of times we have to do an algorithm. And what we do is we recognize that setup time is unimportant as n increases and that the total runtime as n increases is going to scale by n or whatever the algorithm is. And so for, for algorithm one, it's scaling by n. So our time complexity is what's called O to the n. It's just big O notation. Um, I think it's called order n is kind of why they have the O, but I'm really not sure. But long story short, time complexity is about scalability. Not necessarily how fast an algorithm runs. So let's do uh, another example here. So taking the same list and same goal, let's do an adjusted algorithm. So let's start at the beginning of the algorithm, and or sorry, the beginning of the list, and then let's check each element again to see if it matches goal, but we stop when we find goal is in the list. So for instance, what we would do in this case is we would go, is Catherine equal to Jesus? No. Is it equal to Madison? No. Is it equal to Kevin? No. So on. Is it equal to Nicholas? No. Is it equal to Catherine? Yes. Stop. So there's going to be different time complexity cases for what I'm going to call a best case scenario and worst case scenario. So you can probably imagine that right now. Imagine if Catherine was the first element in this list. Then we would find it immediately. It wouldn't matter how big this list was. This list could be 10 elements, it could be 100, n could be 80, n could be 100, n could be 1,000, n could be a million. If it's the first element in the list, you're going to find it immediately, and it's going to take the same amount of time, right? So that's a best case scenario. Worst case scenario is obviously when Catherine's at the end of the list. Then you have to check through the entire list, and n is going to matter a lot, because if n is 3 million, then you got to check 3 million elements before you find Catherine. So oftentimes with algorithms, there could be a different time complexity for different situations. And that's what we use what's called best case and worst case scenarios. And then there's one more thing, we call it average case. And we'll talk about what average case means here in a sec. But let's look at this chart carefully. So first thing I want you to notice is time complexity scalability. That again is the biggest thing I can tell you in this entire video. So algorithm one, our best case scenario and our worst case scenario. So remembering algorithm one is you check the entire list regardless is going to be the same thing. And if those two are the same thing, then the average case is going to be the same thing. Because on average, you're still checking the entire list. It's going to be O n, which we've decided because if we increase n, which is the number of elements in the list, then we're also increasing the amount of time it takes to do that algorithm linearly. So n is a linear, because there's no term here, a linear uh, order or a linear time complexity for algorithm one. Now our adjusted algorithm one, our best case scenario is what we call O1. One just means it's not related to N. So I wouldn't harp on the number one too much. It doesn't mean it takes one second or it doesn't mean anything really, except that it's constant. So the time it takes to run that algorithm is constant no matter how big the list is or how big N is. Our worst case is going to be when N is at the end. And Imagine what our average case might be. Well, it really depends. In this case, it's going to be hard to calculate our average case because it will depend on where Catherine generally is, right? If Catherine generally is in the beginning, then our best case is going to be, well, if, if it's the first one on the list always, our best case will be one. Now, you may think, well, okay, what if it's random? So what if Catherine can be in any location at a uniform probability? Then you may think that we have N here and over two. 
right? As our on over two or time complexity of n over two. However, this is incorrect because again, we remember that we're talking about scalability. So for instance, imagine the list is a seven element list, then on average, Catherine would be in the middle if they all have the same probability. And so we would find it in three elements. However, if we double that list, then we have 14 elements, then it's gonna, we're gonna find around seven-ish, right? Which is still about double between three and seven. So it still scales at O to the N. Then the average case will actually be the same as the worst case. But long story short here is that we have multiple algorithms here and we have best cases, worst cases, and average cases. And they are different, uh, but we're doing the same thing. We're, we're performing the same function here. So let's look at another example to really hone this in. Here we have a list of numbers. And our goal is to determine how many times two numbers in the list, including itself twice, can add up to six. So let's figure out what that means. So what we can say is we'll look at this number and are there any numbers that also add up to six, including this? So I would say negative five and 11 can do it. So that's one. And then three and three can do it with itself. That's two, so on and so forth. So I think negative two and eight can do it here. Three, negative six can't do it with anything. 10 would need a negative four, which I don't see. Five and one can do it. And just to kind of finish this off, eight would need a negative two, which we've already counted. Um, and then 11 would need a negative five, which we've already counted. Two would need a four, which we can't. All right, so then the answer is four here. So let's actually formalize an algorithm for how we figured this out. So I'll call it algorithm two. For each number, add it, so add each number with every other number, including itself, which I forgot to write here, but including itself, and just check if the number is six. So that's kind of what we were doing, right? We, we took negative five and we added it with itself, which is negative five, then we added it with three, then negative two, then so on and so forth. So this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 element list. And so we would do 10 different sums with the negative five. Then we would do the same thing, 10 different sums with the three and so on and so forth. So how many different sums will we do? 10 times 10, which is 10 squared or 100, right? And so here we notice that we have 10 elements in the list. However, we have 10 squared things to do. So if in this algorithm, we had instead of the list numbers being a 10 element list, if we had a 100 element list, it would be 100 squared. So the amount of things we have to do is going to be the square of n. So let's figure out how long does algorithm 2 take to run. n is still number of elements in the list. And total runtime is still set up plus processing time. However, in this algorithm, in algorithm two, it's n squared. And so we still assume set up as point two and point one for processing time. And if you run through the same analysis, you'd recognize that algorithm two has a time complexity of O n squared, or just we would say n squared, or we would say linear, or excuse me, wow. Or we would say quadratic, right, because of the n squared. So if algorithm one of the other problem had a time complexity of n and algorithm one adjusted from the other problem had a worst case time complexity of n, we would call those a linear time complexity. We'd call this one quadratic. So let's look at one more thing here. Take the same problem. This is the same problem. And let's adjust this algorithm a little bit as well. And again, you've probably recognized. So one way we can adjust this algorithm is recognize that going backward is pointless since we've already found the pair, the sum, if we go forward. So for instance, if we take this and multiply, or sorry, add it to, where are we, 11, that would give us six. And so when we get to 11, we really don't have to check backward because we already know that that pair exists. And so what we can do is for each number, add it with itself and every number in front of it, in front of it, and check up the number six. So for instance, we would have 10 numbers to check for negative five because it's self, three, negative two, so on, but only nine numbers to check for three, only eight numbers to check for two, and so on. So this will more be like the sum of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or the sum of one to n 
is going to be the number of things we have to do in the list. So let's try to figure out what that would look like in terms of time complexity. So algorithm two, it was easy to figure out how many iterations we have to do. Iterations means the number of times we have to do it in an algorithm. So that is going to be n, which is the number of items in the list, plus n, plus n, so on, or n quadratic, right? A quadratic algorithm. When we figure this out already, well, algorithm two is going to be a little different. It's going to be n plus n minus one plus n minus two. So we see that here, 10, 9, 8, et cetera, up to the point where we don't really have to check anything, which is at the end of the list. So using a little bit of uh, math here, we can find out exactly what this sum would be. So the sum of all of this is going to be equal to this. And so two ways to come up with this. There's like an equation for partial sums. So you can use that. Or you can recognize that this is going to be symmetric, right? Because each element is losing one. And so you could just find the middle element, which is what this part of the term does. Finds like the middle element, which is the average, and just multiply it by this. Whatever works for you, whatever makes sense to you, you can use. And I'll leave that up to you to really figure out how I came up with this. And, and just factoring this out gives us this. So that looks like our time complexity. However, it really isn't. And we have to recognize one thing. So we've already decided as n increases that setup time becomes unimportant and that coefficients become unimportant because we're looking at what it scales by. However, there's one more concept, which is as n increases, we're considering n to be really, really high. And so scalability is going to be dominated by the squared power. And again, I'll leave that up to you to go through the analysis we did before with checking when n is 5, 10, and then go up to really, really high numbers. And notice that scalability is dominated by higher powers. So if that's the case, then this goes away. And we've already decided coefficients should not be in time complexity because it's all about scalability scalability only. And so this algorithm also has a time complexity of quadratic. So I want you to recognize that. This is algorithm one stuff. Algorithm two also has a time complexity of O to the N squared. And it's best case and worst case because we have to check the amount of times this happens. So there's no way we can like cut it off. And so we're always going to check the whole entire list. And so best case, worst case are going to be the same. And when that's the case, average case is going to be the same. And then same thing here. Best case, worst case, average case, because in every case we have to go through the whole list multiple times. So the thing I want you to recognize here is algorithm two is always going to be faster than algorithm one, just by the nature of what it is, right? We don't have to do all of those extra sums. But its time complexity is always the same. And so can time complexity be a measure of how fast, oops, can time complexity be a measure of how fast or slow an algorithm is? Not exactly, because algorithm two adjusted has the exact same time complexity as algorithm two, but runs faster every single time. So that's the conclusion I want us to make is time complexity is a measure of scalability. It is not directly a measure of how fast or slow an algorithm is.